Last time we talked about the Eilenberg Moore category and the fact that every monad gives rise to an adjunction via the category of algorithm, otherwise known as the Eilenberg Moore category. This time we're going to give the other answer or another answer to that and show that there's another way of getting out an adjunction uh, that gives rise to a monad. And this is the Kleisley category. So what we'll do this time is define the Kleisley category, and probably what we'll do next time is show how to give the adjunction. Uh, the Kleisley category of the monad, T on C, has... Oh, by the way, this category is sometimes called Kle T, that's KL, and it's also sometimes written C sub T. Um, remember last time we had the Eilenberg Moore category, which was the upper T, and this will be the lower T. It's kind of the dual situation and very, very related. Okay, so what are the objects of this category? Well, the objects are in fact just the same as the objects of C. What are the morphisms? Well, the morphisms are obviously going to be a bit more exciting. With, for the Eilenberg Moore category, it was a little bit more complicated to find the objects and very much less complicated to find the morphism. This time it's the other way around. This is sort of one of those conservation of complicatedness things. Um, the complicatedness has to be somewhere. Right. So a morphism in the Kleisley category from A to B, so the morphisms in here are defined to be the morphisms in C from A to TB. And to be clear about this, I'll write these as morphisms A to B with a line through them so that we know what we're talking about, where these are just ordinary morphisms like that. So now we have to define composition and identity. So let's think about this for a second. Composition, we've got to say given an F and a G, given a composable F and G, in the Kleisley category, we have to produce a map from A to C in the Kleisley category. So, of course, F is secretly it's a map from A to TB. G is a map from B to TC. And we're looking for a map from A to TC. Okay, stare at this for a second and see how we could possibly come up with a map from A to TC. We can't just stick them together in the middle because they won't go. But what we can do is we can hit this with T, yes. we hit it with T, and now we haven't quite landed in the right place, but mu is now going to come to the rescue, because if we stick mu on the end here, it's going to take us back down to TC. So we've got a map from A to TC, which is exactly what we wanted, because that's the form of a map A to C in the Kleisley category. Okay, so that's what composition is. What are the identities going to be? So for every object A, we need a map in the Kleisley category from A to A. And of course, that's a map in the actual category from A to TA. What could it possibly be? What could it possibly be? Yes, it's going to be eta, the unit for the monad. Okay, so composition comes from mu, and the identities come from eta, and no prizes for guessing. Well, I shouldn't say that. I should say there's some fantastic prize for guessing that the axioms for a category are going to come from the axioms for a monad. So let's check what we've got to do. We've got to show that this composition is associative. And in fact, the hardest part of this is writing down the thing that we have to show. But we're going to remain calm and write it down very slowly. So on the one hand, we're going to start with F from A to B, G from B to C, and H from C to D. OK, so first of all, let's, do, um, let's compose F and G first, and then compose it with H afterwards. So composing with this part is exactly what's down here. Right? So first we do F, and then we do T of G, and then we use mu to get us back down to the right place again. Okay? And now we're going to compose this whole thing with H, so we've got to do T of H, and then we've got to use mu to get us down to the right place. Right? Fine. Now, the other thing we have to do is we've got to do H composed with G composed with F. So let's just do H composed with G first. Uh, H composed with G, we start with G, 
And then we do t of h, which takes us to t squared of d, and then we use mu to get us down to the, down to the right place again. Okay. Now, I didn't really write that far enough along, whoops. We've got to compose it with f. And to compose it with f, first we've got to hit this entire thing with t. Okay, so let's hit the entire thing with t. t squared h, t cubed d, t mu d, and t squared d. And then we stick f at the beginning and mu at the end. Right? So that's what the other association is. So what we've got to show is that this chap here is the same as that one there. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's um, somehow write them closer together. Let's get rid of this. And let's have a look at this. So what we've got to show is that this is the same as that. But oh look, it's definitely the same all the way up to here. Now let's just fill it in, because it, it, well, it helps me anyway when I'm trying to show that a diagram commutes to have it as an actual diagram. So here's t squared of h. Here's uh, t mu d which goes to t squared d, and here's a mu d. Okay. Now, you can sort of see, maybe, there's a mu here and a mu here, and it wants to be a naturality square, and if we change this around here, it will be a naturality square. We do mu at t d, and can we do mu that, can we do that? Well, look, this is an axiom for t, the monad, that's the, associ the associativity square, and this is now a naturality square for mu. So, hurrah, we've actually got the... Uh, associativity that we want. And it came out of the associativity square. Uh, how long have I got? All right. For the identities, well, I'll leave it to you, but you can probably work out by now that the identities are going to come from the other two monad axioms, because there's a left identity and a right identity in the category, and they're going to come from the left and right unit axioms for the monad. Now, the thing I really want to say about the Clivesy categories, you might be thinking, what on earth is this thing? What has it got to do with anything? Well, the way to think about it is to think that it's really just the category of free algebras. Last time we had the category of all algebras and we showed how to construct free ones and found the adjunction like that. This is, this is really just the category of free algebras. You might say to yourself, wait a minute, the objects are all the objects of the category. How can that possibly be? Well, think about the morphisms for a second. A morphism from A to T, B. Now, if T, T is given by an adjunction, G, F, B let's just think about any old adjunction giving this, then the map from A to GFB under the transposition is really just corresponding to a map from F of A to F of B. And we have a perfectly good adjunction giving rise to this T. We gave it last time. It's the one going to the category of algebras, right? Uh, so here's the free algebra. Here's the forgetful functor. So this is saying that a map from A to TB, which is a map from A to B in the Clisley category, is really corresponding to a map between the free algebras um, in uh, the free algebras that we got from doing this free algebra construction. So what's going on here is that secretly you should think of this object A as really being the free algebra on A. So you can think of A as really being the free algebra, which remember is given which is given by mu, like that. And if you wanted to be really technical about it, you could literally take the subcategory, the full subcategory of T alg, whose objects were the free, the free algebras, and show that that category is equivalent to this category. It's just two ways of presenting the same thing. So hopefully, you've got an idea of why you should think of the Clisley category as the category of free algebras. And even more hopefully, you might be able to see how there's going to be a canonical adjunction giving rise to t, because really it's just part of this adjunction that we did last time.